this video, I'll walk you through the design of this guitar boost pedal, which are designed completely discreetly, so using individual transistors, resistors, and capacitors. So let's get started. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. The effect pedal we're talking about in this video was actually designed using Altium Designer. And if you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, you can go to altium.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's lab and get yourself an Altium Designer free trial as well as 25% off your first license purchase. I'll leave a link to this in the description below. Thank you also very much to JLC PCB for sponsoring this video. I had this board manufactured, also fully assembled by them. If you'd like to get the design files for this board, please go to fills-lab.net forward slash contact, fill in the form, and I can send you the design files. The boost pedal you just heard was this boost I designed using Altium Designer and is a simple clean boost and can also be used to push, a, for example, a valve amplifier into overdrive, which is what you just heard me play. A clean boost or a simple boost like this simply adds gain or amplification to the signal without actually inducing its own distortion within a limited range, of course. The boost I designed here is suitable pretty much just for guitar. It has a fairly limited frequency response, a high input impedance, and a gain from unity up to about 10 times linear or about 20 dB. This is the circuit diagram for this boost, and this is something I designed myself. Even though it looks fairly complicated, and it is in fact rather overkill for this application, I thought it would be interesting because it combines quite a few different analog circuit design ideas. I'll explain this circuit in some detail, but won't go into things such as how to design a current source, sings, long tail pairs, and so on. For all of that, I'd highly recommend watching my video number 53, which is Op Amp Theory and Design, and this takes you through some of the circuits you'll see in this video. For example, long tailed pairs, current sources, negative feedback, and so on. We can break the circuitry down into various sections, and for that, I've made a little block diagram. For many guitar pedals, especially overdrive and boost pedals, this will be somewhat similar. We'll always have some sort of input buffer on the left, so when we plug our guitar in, our guitar has a fairly high output impedance, up to about 15 kilo ohms for humbucking pickups, so we need some sort of impedance conversion. This is usually achieved by this unity gain buffer, and I've chosen an input impedance of about one mega ohm, which is very typical for guitar pedals. On the other side, when we feed that into the amp or into our next effect pedal, we need another buffer. Again, an impedance conversion to provide a low impedance at the output. And I've chosen a buffer with, you know, 100 ohms defined output impedance. And of course, it doesn't hurt to go a bit lower as well. The sections in the middle are my amplification stage. And you could go with a simple common emitter amplifier or a simple op amp, but I've chosen to go completely discreet and make my own essentially mini operational amplifier, consisting predominantly of a long tailed pair, so a differencing amplifier, and a common emitter amplifier. Now, this combination of the long tailed pair and common emitter amplifier, and I'd highly suggest you check out the op amp video, has incredibly large open loop gain. So 60, 70, 80 dBs of open loop gain. And of course, this is unusable if you want to use, for example, for a guitar pedal. This is why we apply negative feedback via this circuitry on the right. So we take the output, divide it down with a potential divider and feedback into the inverting input of this long tailed pair, very similar to an op amp. And in fact, this looks rather like a non-inverting operational amplifier configuration. So with our large open loop gain, we can reduce uncertainty, reduce non-linearity, help with bandwidth and so on. And we apply this negative feedback by dividing down the output and sending some back to the inverting input. This is quite nice because then we can use, for example, the top or the bottom resistor in this configuration and make that variable. If we make this variable, we can change the amount of negative feedback applied and therefore change the closed loop gain anywhere between unity and 10 times, or 20 dB. This parallel capacitor essentially reduces the closed loop bandwidth, so it acts as a low pass filter. And then this is the way I predominantly limit my upper bandwidth. Similarly, this AC capacitor down here will act as some sort of high pass filter together with the one kilo ohm resistor. So now we've gone over the very simple block diagram of the system, let's see how that corresponds to the discrete implementation in Altium Designer. Again, we'll go through section by section, so don't be worried too much about the overall schematic. Our power input is VCC, and typically for guitar pedals, that's a nine volt battery or nine volt power supply. I ESD protect it, some very crude reverse polarity protection in form of this diode, and then this simple RC Pi filter with rather large capacitors. And because this is analog and such a low frequency, it's fine to use this 100 ohm resistor and these large capacitors, so I get a very low cutoff frequency and filter out any power supply noise that might be apparent. 
Also keep in mind this only works for low current designs, a device like this draws you know, in the order of a couple of milliamps. And then we get our 9 volt, hopefully clean power supply voltage at the top here. Keep in mind we are only running off a single 9 volt battery or 9 volt power supply, so we have to do some biasing to make sure we get our maximum output swing between ground and 9 volts. Let's start on the left with our guitar input. We have our input signal, ESD protection, and this RF filter consisting of R2, C3, and a tad of R3. R2 and C3 predominantly form an RF low pass filter, so one of a 2 pi RC with 100 ohms and 100 picofarads gets me somewhere in the range if you know 1 to 2 megahertz. We want to have an RF filter before we hit any semiconductor element because semiconductors can behave non linearly and therefore demodulate any RF audibly into the audio band. In case there's any DC apparent at the input, and also because we have to bias our first buffer stage, I have this coupling capacitor C4 to make sure essentially we DC block, and C4 in combination with the input impedance of the buffer we'll see in a second, and R3 forms our high pass filter and sets our lower cutoff frequency as well. The buffer consists of Q1, a JFET, and Q2, another JFET, in a current source configuration. You could use Q1 with just a resistor at its source, would behave of course very easily as a simply unit gain buffer or slightly less than unit gain buffer. We can improve the linearity of this buffer by adding Q2 as a current source, a current sink, to assume we have a pretty much constant current going through Q1. Q1 and Q2 should ideally be matched fairly closely. I've used a JFET because JFETs require next to no bias in current, which means the input impedance is very high, which we can exploit because we want about a mega ohm input impedance for guitars. Now I've bootstrapped R4, meaning that one side of R4 is connected to the gate, the other side is connected pretty much to the source via R5, so the voltage here, at pin 3 or the gate, and the voltage here are approximately the same. So any voltage swing across R4 makes this R4 pretty much invisible. So we basically only get the input impedance of Q1, which means we've increased the input impedance of this buffer. However, I am the other side of C4, I have R3, which is essentially a bleed resistor to make sure C4, one side of the plate, is connected to ground at all times. And we have some sort of discharge path. Because we have very large input impedance of this input buffer in parallel with R3, R3 dominates, so we have about 1 mega ohm of input impedance, together with C4 forms our first high pass filter. So now we've looked at our buffer and explained why we have 1 mega ohm input impedance. We take our output our buffer and feed this into our long tail pair. A long tail pair consists of a pair of bipolar transistors. Of course, you could use field effect transistors and or other types, but I've gone with BJTs and PNPs for this example. Because I'm not really matching these transistors, I have some emitter degeneration, these 100 ohm resistors, which apply local negative feedback. As a load, I've used a current sink, and remember for long tailed pairs, using a large impedance load increases my gain. So that's one positive aspect. On the other side, we have essentially a current source, forming essentially the tail of our long tailed pair, and this is to improve the common road rejection ratio. So Q3, Q4 form one part of my current source, but then I'm duplicating this current mirror or current source with Q10 and Q12. And I'm basing all of this off Q3, which is my bias. R8 at the bottom, 8.2 kilo ohms, effectively sets the current through the long tail pair, as well as through Q10, Q12 and my output stages. The base of Q5 is my non-inverting input and Q6 is my inverting input. And we'll see a second how that gets fed back. At the collector of Q5, we take the output, meaning this output here, and feed this into our common emitter amplifier. The common emitter amplifier has some degeneration in the form of R15 to aid the DC bias, and I'm bypassing this quite heavily with C6 to make sure we get increased gain regardless of R15. As the load of my common limit amplifier, again I'm using a current source, so the impedance of the load times the transconductance of a transistor gives me the overall gain. So the gain of course adds in dB or multiplies linearly between the long tailed pair and this common emitter amplifier. And this is where I get my huge open loop gain from. Huge open loop gain can be quite problematic at high frequencies and that's why I roll this off with C5, essentially shorting input to output of this common emitter amplifier stage at AC with 10 nanofarads, which is very, very large as a Miller capacitor. Usually this would be at about 100 picofarads, but I'm really limiting my bandwidth because I don't need particularly high cutoff frequency for this guitar effects pedal. The output is then fed via R16 straight to an emitter follower, which is PNP type. So I have my load essentially as this current source again to improve linearity as we get a fairly constant current going through Q11. So Q11 in combination with Q12 is my output buffer. 
R19 pretty much defines the impedance of this output buffer, and that's fed via again a coupling capacitor to the output with some ESD protection and a bleed resistor. My negative feedback, the potentiometer and resistor over here, is this volume potentiometer with a parallel capacitor again to limit the bandwidth, and my divider is R18 and C8. I've also added various decoupling as well for each stage, so 100 nanofarads for every amplifier or buffer. Although this might seem like a complicated circuit and I've gone over it rather quickly, I'm just using very simple, straightforward building blocks. JFET buffer with a current sink, long tailed pair, current source, current sink to improve gain and to improve common mode reduction ratio. I have my common emitter amplifier with dominant pole compensation with this Miller capacitor C5 and a simple emitter follow output buffer with a current source as a load. Completely overkill pretty much for simple boosts and normally guitar boosts will have, you know, one transistor or two transistors in them and they'll be sold for 100 or 200 euros, whereas I made this, you know, about just a couple of euros per circuit. The overall layout is then also fairly straightforward, simply with some solder pads so I can just solder it into any enclosure I want. The flow is quite straightforward from left to right with any effect pair on the left and our amplifier buffer on the right with our feedback applied. We have a power input, which is 9 volts, recommended, and the volume is simply the potentiometer connection. I have some mounting holes and some fiducials, and that's pretty much it. Audio trace, I've kept fairly thin at about 0.25 millimeters. You want to keep it as small as reasonably possible and manufacturable. And anytime I need a ground connection, I simply dig down using a via and a fat trace to my bottom Keep layer, my which cuts in the bottom ground, ground plane. There's not much to this, the routing of this guitar effects pedal. Anytime I had to jump traces, you could have used a zero on resistor, of course, but I try to keep my jump small, so I dig down, small trace over, dig up with a via. I've now placed two of these PCBs in this enclosure, and with the foot switches, I can either have one on or both on at the same time. You can see four potentiometers. I've actually only wired up two. This was the only enclosure I had available. So let's use this with an analog discovery pro from Digilent to get a frequency response and time domain response look, and then we'll move over to playing some guitar through this. So here we are on the waveform software. I've opened up my wave generator, which is then fed into the input of the boost pedal. And I'm measuring the output simply with my scope. The yellow channel, which is channel one, is measuring the input of the pedal. Channel two is at the output of the pedal. So we can see one of these boosts, then the boosts cascaded as well. So the wave gen I set at about half a volt at a kilohertz. If we click run, that runs. And then in the scope, also click run. And you can see we both have the same scale divisions. So both 500 millivolts per division. Yellow is our input, blue is our output. And now I have just one of the pedals running. So one side running and the potentiometer is set about midway. If I turn my potentiometer all the way counterclockwise, I of course get unity gain, implying all of my output is feedback. And if I decrease the feedback factor, if I increase the value of my potentiometer resistance, I get gain. And quite a lot of it, up to about 20 or over 20 dB, which is 10 times linear. And here we quite nicely see some asymmetrical clipping. We won't get symmetrical clipping with this circuitry because of the way it's designed, but we will get some clipping because we only have a power supply voltage of about 9 volts. So the maximum reasonable amplification we seem to get before clipping is plus minus 2 volts. So 4 volts peak to peak. For nine volt supply voltage. Of course, we could crank the supply voltage, but right now I'm just connecting my guitar pedal power supply. Let me move back my potentiometer to about midway and then turn on the second circuit. Now, my second circuit, the potentiometer is pretty much all the way down. I can start increasing that. And because it's already being amplified by the first circuit, we're going to get clipping. I haven't even turned up the potentiometer halfway. So we're already getting quite harsh clipping, as you can see here. So this really isn't pretty. I can now I've turned up the right potentiometer all the way. I'm turning up the left potentiometer all the way, and we're getting some pretty severe square wave clipping. So in this way, we can cascade these pedals together to, to get some distortion. So now let's move over to the network analyzer, which lets us do body bots of the system. So right now, I've only enabled one of these boost pedals, and I fully cranked the gain or the amplification. So according to our circuitry, if we fully crank the gain, we have the maximum resistance at the volume potentiometer, so 10K, basically a non-inverting amplifier. So we get 10K divided by the divider resistor, so 10 over one, we add one to that. So we should get an amplification of 11, which in dB, simply taking the logarithm of that times 20, we should get about 20.8 dB. Now remember the potentiometer has about a 10 or 20% tolerance. So we might get higher or lower than this, depending on the actual tolerance of the potentiometer. 
The Go Meta waveforms, I'm doing a 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz sweep, fairly broad steps, so only 51 steps across that whole range. So let's do a single measurement of channel two. The top is my magnitude in decibels and the bottom is my phase. Remember, we also have a fairly large Miller capacitor as well as a fairly large feedback capacitor, which acts then both as a low pass filter. So we'll get a heavy amount of filtering. In the passband, we have either cursor 20.6, a bit above 20.7 dB of gain, which corresponds nicely to our theoretical result of 20.8 dB. Remember, the potentiometer has quite a large variance. On the left hand side, trying to, the cutoff frequency is very low, so even lower than 20 Hz, which is good. But on the other side, because of our large 10 nanof nanofarad capacitors, our 3 dB point should be about 17.6, 17.8, so about 1.5 kHz. Let's just verify that as well. We have this volume potentiometer at 10 kilo ohms right now in parallel with 10 nanofarads. One over two pi RC is a cutoff frequency. So it's about 1.6, 1.5 kilohertz. So that matches up quite nicely as well. Also keep in mind, I kept my stimulus or my amplitude of the input rather low at 100 millivolts because we're getting quite significant amplification. So about 10 times that. I could of course increase that, but I don't want to start introducing distortion into these measurements. If we add in a second stage, of course, we simply double our dB gain or 10 times our linear gain if the potentiometers are set to maximum. If I somewhat center my potentiometer, so hopefully around 5 kilo ohms resistance, and then do another measurement, we should get a higher cutoff frequency and a lower gain, of course. So the gain should be about halfway, so around 10 dB. And, you know, I've just eyed centering the potentiometer, so this looks about right. We get about 8.7, about 9 dB of gain around the midband, and our new cutoff frequency is about, you know, 9.3 kilohertz, which makes sense. I've hooked up this pedal now with a 9 volt power supply, plugged in my Charvel Sandimus, and on the other end, I'm going straight into the Bogner 3534 amplifier on the second channel, which is a light overdrive, and we'll push that into distortion using our pedal. Right now, the pedal is off. Let's see what it sounds like. <laughs> And now I've turned the pedal on, the potentiometer all the way clockwise so we get maximum boost, so about 10 times gain, this will nicely overdrive the amplifier. <laughs> 